I'm Madeline George, um, the playwright of Hurricane Diane, and this is the director of Hurricane Diane, Lee Silverman. Um, and in a moment, I'll introduce our illustrious cast. Um, uh, I'm going to speak to you just a little bit about uh, the origin of the play for me, how I came to write it, and what it's sort of all about. And then uh, we'll hear a little teaser, a little bit of the beginning, um, and then we'll hear a little bit of the middle. And then Lee and I are going to join the cast over in the performance space, and we'll have a sort of more free-floating conversation about the themes of the play. Um, and. Uh, grill each other mercilessly about our experience <clears throat> because um, we know each other a little bit well. This is the, the production at New York Theatre Workshop is actually going to be the second production of the play. Um, the play was originally commissioned by Two River Theatre, which is in Red Bank, New Jersey. And um, I'm a playwright in residence there, thanks to the Mellon Foundation. And um, the artistic director there, John Diaz, uh, said that he wanted, to, he wanted me to write a play for them specifically. And I had had in my mind this idea about a play that was sort of a sequel to The Bacchae by Euripides. So I don't know if you're familiar with The Bacchae. Um, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, plays from the classical um, oeuvre. It's, um, <laughs> I can't see your faces, and so I'm, used, I'm really not used to talking to like a dark room of people, so. Um, uh, the Bacca by Euripides, you know, it's like, it's a late play. Um, Euripides is a late classical writer, and it's a late play of Euripides. In fact, it was first performed after he died in 405 BCE. And uh, basically, the plot is, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the god Dionysus comes to the town of Thebes that has uh, denied his divinity and decides to teach the city a lesson to prove that he is a god. Um, that's the whole story. He shows up in the very beginning of the play and is like, I am Dionysus, I am actually a god, this town has denied me, I'm gonna make them see that I'm really God. And then he goes about, bit, like piece by piece, just bringing ruin to the people in the city. And then finally at the end, there's a huge frenzy, or we hear from a messenger, there's a huge frenzy where he's inspired all of these women to tear animals limb from limb, particularly the mother of the king of the city who tears her son limb from limb. She drags his torn body onto the stage. Dionysus is like, now you see I'm really a God, I'm out, and he leaves. That's the whole play. Um, so I really have always loved this play. It's very strange, hard to figure out exactly what it's about. Um, and then I was driving uh, a long distance uh, at one point listening uh, to the audiobook of Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire, which is an incredibly interesting book about the evolution of plants. And he has a chapter, I swear to God, this is all coming around. You're going to see it comes back together. He has a chapter on the, the history of the cultivation of the apple in America, and Johnny Appleseed. We have a sort of idea about Johnny Appleseed that he's sort of like a disney figure, a friendly, um, you know, orchard planter who went across the country uh, helping people with their gardens. But Pollen does a lot of research into the history of Johnny Appleseed, and he discerns that he was an incredibly strange, almost always barefoot, slightly mentally cracked kind of saint who did travel the country planting apple trees, but apple trees at that time were, people grew apples in order to make hard cider, not healthy fruit. <laughs> and Pollen was like, in this, in the, I was listening to this audio book, and then he says, really, Johnny Appleseed was the Dionysus of America. Dionysus, the god of wine, went about you know, the, ancient, uh, the ancient world planting vines for, for wine. And I was like, what if Dionysus did come back to America? Like, what if someone, what if we could see that collision of uh, ancient, like, fecund, uh, wild cultivation of plants and the kind of hermetic suburban America that, um, that's, that we know so well? That's the origin of, then I pitched, so I pitched this idea to, this, to John Diaz at Two River Theater. He was like, if you can pull it off, um, and over time, as I was working on the play in collaboration with Lee and then in collaboration with these actors, um, I, it became clear that this is, this is a story about climate change. It was a story about how do we hold ourselves in these sealed uh, houses and sealed yards? How have we become dissociated from the, the, the earth in its wild state? And what are we doing to ourselves? Um, by remaining alienated from, from the natural world that, that should be all around us, touching us all the time. So that's sort of the origin of the play. 
in our version of, uh, of this story, we do see the god Dionysus. The god comes back in the form of a butch lesbian landscape architect, obviously. Um, <laughs> And over the course of the play, it's a flip of the original. It's a flip of the Euripides. So the idea being humans have, well, our power dynamic with the gods may have changed at this point. Um, and the god, in, uh, in, in, in our story, the, the humans lay waste to the god. Spoiler. Uh, <laughs> what else? Do I need to say anything else? I will say, to set up this, um, what you're going to see, the, the, pre, the, the sort of staging premise is that there's just the one set of, uh, of, a, of a suburban kitchen, and it's as if the four, you know, McMansions on the cul-de-sac are, are indistinguishable one from the other. So, the, so you, you'll see that the, the characters sort of weave in and out of the same set. Just picture that in your, in your mind. What else? Am I missing anything else? That's enough to set it up. Um, I want to say the names of the actors, but I need the lights to come up on them in order to make that meaningful. Oh, there they are. Amazing. <laughs> uh, the, I'm going to go down the list. We have Nikia Mathis playing Renee and Mia, and Mia Barron playing Carol. <laughs> Becca Blackwell as Diane. In the production at New York Theatre Workshop, we'll have Danielle Scrostad as Pam, but here we have illustrious star of stage and screen, Lisa Crone, filling in. <laughs> and Kate Weatherhead as Beth. Uh, I'm going to carry on my folksy narrator thing I have going here, and I'm going to read stage directions. Um, and we'll start at the top of the play. Lights up. With a great wind, the god appears, garbed in the robes of an ancient deity. I have returned! And it begins. <laughs> you recognize me? No? God of agriculture, wine, and song? It's cool, it's been a while. I am called by many names, Bacchus, Bromius, Dionysus. I was born many thousands of years ago, sprang fully formed from my father's thigh, crossed the foamy seas of the Aegean to Asia Minor, and then traveled down on a foot into Thrace, uh, hunting and reveling and bringing ruin to those who doubted me. I was <laughs> huge back then. <laughs> oh, my name was on the lips and tongue of every frustrated housewife in the greater Mediterranean. Oh, how I how I worked my mysteries is I would ride into town on a leopard or a bull or a leopard bull hybrid if they had one handy and my rose uh, gold curls billowing behind me and I'd, I'd call out, women, my women, come to me. And they always came. I never had a problem with them coming. I always had 100% particip participation. And then I'd draw them out, my Bacchae, down the village streets, past the city walls, out into the fragrant wild and wilderness beyond, and there they taste my honey, gulp my wine, thrash and writhe and weep and dance and stroke animals and lie with animals and tear animals limb from limb and become animals and cry out my name over and over. Oh, yes. uh, this is in my heyday I'm talking about. And then, it was so weird, they forgot about me. <laughs> I mean, it happened gradually. At first, I mean, they still knew my name, but it started to have uh, like a quaint ring to it, or like air quotes around it, you know? Or, well, you know, Dionysus. You know, and then it dev devolved into an adjective, something in any imposter could be, Dionysian. Or, as if I wasn't the one, the one and only one who could bring you to that particular kind of ecstasy. And then, I mean, you know your own story. You started to settle for ecstasy knockoffs, creature comforts, customer satisfaction, and at a certain point, I just stopped putting myself out there. 
The gods don't die. <laughs> they just change form. We're still with you, all of us. I mean, they don't care about you. Those other guys, Hermes, Apollo. I haven't heard from those assholes in centuries. <laughs> but I stayed close to you. I couldn't walk away. I don't know why. I mean, maybe because I was born of a mortal woman. I, I've kept busy. I've done a million different things over the years. I mean, ooh, sailor, stripper, rock star, mayor. Uh, most recently, I've been living outside of Burlington, Vermont. I had my own landscaping business up there with a focus on sustainability and a small scale permaculture. <laughs> and I've been happy. <laughs> Vermont, you know. Great hiking trails, curbside compost collection. I mean, I was living off the grid with a bunch of lesbian, lesbian separatists in a consensus-based community. It was fucking paradise. I had every intention of staying forever. <laughs> but you've been busy too, haven't you? Hmm. Mining and stripping and slashing and burning and generally despoiling the green earth that gave you life. The green earth, <laughs> it used to be my job to connect you to. And it's not like I haven't been aware of your misdeeds. I, I've been watching you fuck shit up for hundreds of years. And I've been objecting, objecting through all the usual channels. You know, I've signed the petitions. I've marched <laughs> the marches. But it's all like you're in some kind of trance. I mean, no matter how loud I shout, I can't seem to wake you up. I'm looking at you and you don't know. You don't know what time it is on the cosmic clock. I mean, how could you, really, with your bird lives, <laughs> your fruit fly lives, <laughs> hatching and feeding and breeding and dying all in the blink of a god's eye? So let me tell you what time it is. It's 11 fucking 45. And if I keep, let, keep on letting you with your wicked ways, the glaciers are going to come and melt, and the permafrost is going to thaw, and the plagues will start, and the waters will rise, and fast forward a hundred years, and there won't be a single human being left on the planet to worship me. And that's not going to work for me, okay? Because <laughs> you're mine, you stupid heads. And I am yours. You ever tried to do a get a cockroach to do a ritual for you? You ever tried to inspire a newt to sing your name? <laughs> My options are dwindling, and the last thing I need is to have to fuck off back to Mount Olympus, uh, Mount Olympus, the dullest fucking place in the universe, to chill for all time by the flame of eternal boredom with Apollo, who keeps calling me fag every time I get up to get a cold drink. <laughs> so it's time for bold action. And if I can get a critical mass of you to worship me again, I think I can actually move the needle on climate change. It's not just that there's no fossil fuels involved in running my mysteries. I mean, are they are carbon neutral. It's that I am the one, the one and only one who can reignite your connection to the living planet. I'm the one who can make you see the wild world, make you know that you are of this earth and not just here to plunder it till it implodes. And I still, I, I know people can get weird about pagan ecstasy rituals, so I'm not gonna come in bl guns a-blazing full Greek. <laughs> but my plan is to slide in on the DL. Hit him with the landscaping design angle. Hmm? And then, when I'm all the way in, pull out the stops. <laughs> Diane throws off her god robes to reveal her gardening outfit. Work vest, long shorts, smart wools, boots. What do you think? <laughs> I'd hire me. <laughs> now, the minimum number I need to start up a mystery cult is four. Two ladies on the right and two ladies on my left. It's a balancing. I never understood it exactly, but 
believe me, you don't want to try and pull off the ritual dance, let alone the sacrifice, with fewer than four acolytes. And in terms of my kickoff spot, I need some place that's trembling on the edge of civilization. Not total wilderness, but not inside the city-state walls. The mix, uh, mixed and mingled liminal zone where my powers of persuasion will find welcome among the women folk. So I'm looking here at Monmouth County, New Jersey. Oh. <laughs> I see a nice little circular street with four ladies all lined up for me in a row, <laughs> like petals on a flower. One, two, three, four, boom. <laughs> and once my first unit is activated, it'll just take off like wildflower. My new priestesses will clear the way for me and I'll move out into the heartland, down into the southeast, out across the prairies, the fruited plains, bringing live frenzy, bacchic realness to Main Street America. <laughs> Before you know it, we'll be knocking at your door. <sighs> you nervous? Don't be. It's going to be okay. It's going to feel amazing to save the world. Lights. Lights up, morning in Carol Fleischer's kitchen. Granite countertops, granite topped island with a sink in it, four high end stools. Upstage center, a set of big French doors that give out onto a pale suburban veil. Carol in close tailored Talbots with half drunk coffee in hand. Diane with arms folded standing very still. I love my house. I love my neighborhood. Okay. The whole cul-de-sac has tons of charm. But the thing is, and I'm embarrassed even to admit this, since the day we moved in, I've barely touched the yard. I am just hopeless outdoors. When you look up brown thumb in the dictionary, there's a big picture of my face. Okay. <laughs> and it's terrible because I just drool over the gardening spreads in HGTV magazine. I'd kill to do over my yard myself, but I have to face facts. I'd only make things worse. That's where you come in, Diane. It is Diane, right? Diane. <laughs> Diane, I need you to bring my fantasies to life. Okay. <laughs> now, in terms of my wish list, I do have a few things I won't compromise on, but basically, I'm easy. Great. I like nice, clean lines and fun, fresh colors. And I can be really clear and upfront about what I want. Great, so should we head out back? And oh, take a I, I don't know around? if we even need to go outside. I actually wanted to start by showing you a few clippings just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. She hauls out a massive accordion folder crammed with clippings. Don't panic, I'm not going to make you look through this whole thing. I'm not panicked. I, I might have a little issue with clipping. My husband would say it's pathological, but we all have our quirks, right? Some people place bets with real money on imaginary sports teams, and some people clip pictures out of garden magazines. Really, which one causes more harm at the end of the day? <laughs> anyway, this is just to give you a sense of what I'm looking for. Carol fans out a few clippings. Diane picks one up. Ten quick fixes for tricky front porches. Oh, you know HGTV. They love a cute list. Six hot mulches you need to spread right now. Oh, I just... <laughs> I, I clipped that one for the picture. I didn't even read that article. Which magazine did you say this is from again? Oh, HGTV? Mm. I was under the impression that was a television show. Well, channel? It's a television channel with many different shows on it, but... This is their affiliated magazine. I have to say, I'm surprised. You don't read HGTV? No, I don't. Even though you're in the business? <laughs> I'm not in this business. Oh, well, I'm sure it must seem lightweight to you. Really, I just get it for the pictures. Oh, and I guess because I have a personal connection, my neighbor, Renee, is one of the editors, so I always sort of feel like I have the inside scoop. Anyway, what I really love is when they get a theme going, a nice concept that unifies the entire space. So, oh, like, here, see how the shutters pick up the purple of the hydrangea, and then they carry that same color down to these little flowers. I don't know what they're called. Pansies. Right. 
That's such a unique touch. <gasps> and here, uh, I love what they did with this rounded hedge. Isn't that different? And then they pick up the same curve here in this wrought iron accent bench. I have to tell you, I am just dying for a wrought iron accent bench. <laughs> I love how it is so modern and so old fashioned at the same time. That is pretty much number one on my wish list, wrought iron accent bench. I don't do furniture. <laughs> no? Okay, that's okay. I guess I was just thinking that an accent bench is exactly the kind of focal piece that would really boost our curb appeal. Curb appeal. Yes, not that we're looking to sell. My husband and I, we love this house, we love this neighborhood, but if we ever did have to move, we wouldn't want to have done anything that would hurt our resale value, you know? Like, for example, I don't know if you saw on your, on your way in the first house on the right, my neighbor Beth's house. Now, to be fair, she's had just the hardest year between you and me. Her husband left her and she's really been struggling. So that's why her lawn, I, I say lawn, it's really more of a hayfield at this point. Bill, my husband Bill was mowing it for her at first, but then I guess he felt he couldn't continue with that activity. So eventually we all just had to be okay with having a big prairie right at the entrance to the cul-de-sac. And oh my goodness, the deer, it's attracting hordes of deer. My neighbor Pam is totally flipped out about the deer. Well, sure, a hungry doe can take out a healthy shrub and five minutes. Yeah, I think it's more diseases that are Pam's concern. Lyme and the other ones deer ticks carry. Anyway, not that you would put in a prairie on purpose, but that's pretty much my only concern. I don't want to do anything that would negatively impact resale value. I want natural but neat. Special but typical. <laughs> Just a really fun, really welcoming outdoor space so that anyone who pulls into our driveway gets practically knocked on their ass with curb appeal. So, does that sound like Let me like tell you a little bit about my philosophy of landscaping, Carol. All right. Well, you I mind would... if I call you Carol? Oh, no. Great. Let me start by telling you about a word that I hate. Oh, okay. A word that... I hate to even pronounce with my lips and tongue a word that you've used a number of times already in our oh conversation dear. that I would actually like to eradicate from human speech along with the object it represents. Okay. The word Carol is curb. <laughs> oh. What is a curb? A curb is a blade that cuts a deep gash into the flesh of the earth and splits it off from the rest of the soil. <laughs> Once long ago, the earth was a single body and threaded through it was a vast web of microfungus, delicate glistening structures invisible to the naked eye that stretched for hundreds and thousands of miles across the entire North American landmass the biggest single organism to ever exist on Earth. <sighs> Fast forward a couple hundred years, and the North American landmass has been hacked to bits. It's lawn, curb, roadway, curb, parking lot, medium strip, Panera, curb. Each little remaining parcel of land isolated, desiccated, starved. My philosophy on landscaping, Carol, is that I will take your dead, dismembered yard and restore it to a semblance of the lush, primeval forest that once stood where we stand right now. Okay, can you, do you have a picture of what that would look like? <laughs> Let me paint you a word picture, Carol. <laughs> Imagine stepping out of your French doors into a fragrant, Paradise, green carpet below, sun dappled canopy above, blueberries, cymbalberries, huckleberries on all sides that just fall into your hand, that puck up to palm at the slightest touch. I mean, imagine cherries at eye level, chestnuts swaying overhead. Imagine the dewy leaves of a pawpaw tree bending down to brush your cheeks as you pass. What, now, what is a pawpaw tree? Uh, a pawpaw is a native fruit tree. Simple leaves, weeping habit, big globular hanging fruit. Globular? I mean, it tastes kind of like a cross between a parsnip and a papaya. Yeah. I put a whole grove of pawpaws back there, probably up to where that blighted sapling is now. Okay. And then beneath that, cascading down that slope, a lush, 
green understory, teeming with beneficial insects, worms, and teeming? beetles, scurrying through vigorous native ground covers, hognuts, and bee ball, foxglove, and all fruit, hawkweed, and bladderwort, and milk vetch. Milk vetch? Yes. That's right, Carol. I can make this fantasy a reality. I'm ready to start right now. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm sorry, but wouldn't the ground covers, the bl uh, bladder wart and milk vetch, compete with the lawn? There will be no lawn. What do you mean? I'm going to rip out your lawn. What? First thing. No. No, I, I, I could never. Uh, I love that lawn. That lawn is the only nice thing about my yard. Well, that lawn is slowly suffocating the earth. It's coming out. <laughs> okay. Okay, I just, uh, I'm just trying to figure out if we can possibly even, uh, I mean, in principle, I'm not opposed to an all-natural concept as long as it doesn't get out of hand. I love cherries. I don't see why I couldn't come to love pawpaws. But it's just, I mean, it's one thing if your husband leaves you and you can't get your act together to mow, and it's another thing to tear up a perfectly nice lawn for no reason. What would the girls think of me? Uh, what girls? Oh, the girls, the other girls. Are, are you referencing a Girl Scout club? Oh, I no, I mean my neighbors who live here with me on the cul-de-sac. You mean women? <laughs> yes, I mean we're close, so we call ourselves the girls. Okay, I'm just getting straight on your preferred terms. You are women, but you refer to yourselves as girls. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, the point is, I just wouldn't feel right not checking with them before I put a new concept into my yard. It's not a new concept, it is the oldest concept in the world. Well, it's, it's new to this area. <laughs> I just wouldn't want to disrupt the neighborhood by bringing in something so unconventional. Carol. <laughs> I think you underestimate yourself. <clears throat> There's an energy that's coming out of this house, out of your... I actually felt it the second I stepped out of my truck. I think you are more open to this than you know. And I can sense in a woman's hair and her skin when she's ready to receive this idea. And <laughs> your skin is so... I don't know, Carol. I sense that you're very, very ready. I'm just... I'm just afraid Don't it... Don't be. I'm just afraid it would be devastating no, Carol, to her. I don't ever want to hear the words curb appeal come out of your pretty mouth again. I need to think about this. Huh? Um, <clears throat> I don't want to make any rash decisions. Uh, okay. But Why don't we just plan to check back at the end of the week after I've had time to run this all by Bill. Are and you then, leaving? Where are you going? Uh, to work. It's, it's uh, 8.45. Oh, I didn't realize you had anything else to do today. Well, I do. My job. Oh, no. It's great. What is it you do? I'm in compliance. With what? <laughs> no, I'm in compliance. I work in the compliance division of Ealing Shear. The pharmaceutical company. Oh, yes. You're familiar? A uh, little bit. I chained myself to your perimeter once or twice. Oh. Oh, you were part of the OM. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame about all those babies born without hearts. Uh, now, they were not born without hearts. They were born with heart defects, correctable defects. And we, those victims were extravagantly compensated. <laughs> okay. Listen, Diane, in the spirit of being really clear and upfront, I think I should say that I don't think this is going to work out. 
What do you mean? I'm really sorry, but thank you so much for your time. It's been very educational learning about your yard forest. Okay, no, no, no. We, we don't want to make any rash decisions. I know, but I think I really can just you save us both the time. But why don't we check back in at the end of the week, no, like you said? We don't need to check back. I'm absolutely sure this is not what I want. But I, I haven't even be started telling you about all the money you'll save on your heating and cooling bills. You're not used to hearing the word no, are you, Diane? You know what, Carol? I'm not. <laughs> well, welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm late for work. Lights. Uh, great, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're gonna jump forward a notch. Um, we hear a little bit from uh, from Diane about like, oh, I'm gonna take a different tack. I'm gonna back out, back back off a little bit. Let them come to it sort of more naturally. We meet Beth, who is the sort of the person referenced in the beginning, who's let her lawn go to seed. And then we join up with everybody on the cul-de-sac, uh, having coffee together on Sunday morning. Lights up on Carol's kitchen Sunday morning. All four girls at the island drinking coffee. Renee, in chic Eileen Fisher neutrals. Carol, in Land's End starfish casual knits. Pam, in a tiger print wrap dress and jewelry so fabulous it could be used to signal a landing plane. <laughs> and Beth, in a slouchy comfy sweater. I might have to sell the house. <gasps> I don't know. Oh, that's really. terrible. It's not really I don't want to, but I don't know how I can hold on to it. It just seems like there's less and less money every day. Well, that's the thing about having no income. How that man could leave you without making adequate provision, that is unspeakable to me. Yeah, it's it's true. That is cowardice. I mean, he cannot get away with this, honey. What that man has done to you is against the law. Well, I don't, I don't know think it's technically actually against the law, by maybe. any law of God or man. That man is a criminal. I'm, I'm not angry at him. Well, you okay. should be. It's you should be on freaking fire. Everyone has to handle things in their own way. Don't All right, they? but what is it for? Commitment. Why do we marry each other? For shits and giggles? He took and he took and he took from you, honey, only to vaporize without so much as a thank you note. I know. When I think of what you did for him every day of his life, but especially on the darkest night in recent memory, we're all down there huddled in my basement suite. And where is he? Out in the driveway, tarping his freaking boat like a child, refusing to shelter in places instructed and who went out and got him. Well, that's that is right. true. That's commitment, showing up for people when the shit hits the fan. That man owes you his freaking life, and he just turns and walks away? I know he has his reasons. Please, what kind of justifiable reasons could he possibly have? And may I also say that this is not how we have survived as a species, by making up reasons to walk away from our commitments. That man is violating all of biology, and P.S., he is clearly a psychopath, not even once calling, not one GD email to inquire about the woman who risked his life to save him. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. We, we know. And you're right, but anyway. I am sorry, okay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to. No, it's okay, you make some good points. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. The main thing is, it's going to be okay. You're stronger than you even know. Oh, thanks, Carol. It's true, Beth. I can still picture you out there in that storm giving that man a fireman's lift. Oh, my oh goodness, yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> you were yes. a hero. Oh, no, no. Pam was the real hero of oh, this that's story. Right. That's right. Pam, Pam. Yeah. <laughs> What are you talking about? Come on, Pam. You know you saved us. You saved us all. <laughs> if it hadn't been for you and your basement suite, we might have ended up like the poor people on Ocean. Oh, oh yeah. So I, terrible what happened to those people on Ocean. I don't know why everybody doesn't reinforce the basement. It's the simplest thing, and you never know when you're going to need a reference. Uh, the simplest thing, you have a police scanner on top of your wet bar. Well, you got to keep up with the scanner. That's where all the real news is. I, I remember you had the weather channel coming into your Bluetooth, a flashlight in one hand, a fresca in the other, and you still managed to keep those kids under control. Please, I would not go through that again with those kids. First step on the new disaster plan, kids and my sister-in-law's in Pennsylvania. Remember the sound that came out of those two when we lost the lights and the freaking Xbox died? The keening. You would have oh, thought they'd been God. hit by a falling tree. And then the sound that came out of you when the cordless uh, phone died. Never again. That's why I had the panic button installed. 
It could be raining nuclear waste, and that thing will still work. And, and then remember in the morning when everyone was digging out and the power was still down, so Dan pulled the grill into the middle of the <laughs> cul-de-sac and cooked us all breakfast <laughs> in his boxer shorts. Dan will be Dan. Bring out your perishables, <laughs> everybody. Bring out your perishables. <laughs> I barely know these people. Do you really need to be out there grilling in your draw? What are you talking about? Barely know these people. After you go through something like that together, your family. That's yeah, that is right. As terrible as it was, I have to be grateful for that night. I got you girls out of it. Mm, it's true. That's right. Everybody we... on the whole cul-de-sac together. Except Bill. Right, except Bill. Well, only because he missed the last train. Right, only because he missed the last train. He got stuck in the city through no fault of his own. It was so sad that he missed the last train and got stuck in the city and missed all the togetherness. Yes, it was. It was very sad. More coffee? Oh, I'm you already going to be up to I, I might as well. I can. That stuff is killing me. All my life I've drunk six cups of coffee a day, and now all of a sudden on cup two, I'm getting these stabbing stomach pains. Oh, that, that is, that is good. no good. How am I so delicate all of a sudden? It's like I woke up one morning 10 years older than I was the night before. It right, happens. that's the way it goes. Oh, that is what happened. The other day, I injured myself eating a carrot. No. Really? I did not, no. I was sitting at my desk eating this carrot, and I guess it was kind of a fibrous carrot, but not so much that you noticed. And I was chewing along, and I turned my head sort of quickly to look at something, and I injured myself. Oh, I mean, that is seriously true. injured. Oh, no. oh, that's just terrible. That's terrible. Is it painful? It's painful, and it's humiliating. I mean, what kind of story is that to tell? Hey, how'd you hurt yourself? Well, I was eating a carrot, and I turned my head. <laughs> oh. We're weak. We're weak, and we're old. It's all downhill from here. You know what it is? We don't do for ourselves enough. That's right. We're helpless. We've gone soft as a people. Oh, well, I'm not helpless, and I'm not supposed to be weak. I pay my guy Dante at Blink, giant sacks of money to punish my core, glutes, and thighs, and I still can't bring in the groceries without my joints hurting. I hurt myself meditating the other day. <laughs> what, you did? How? How, honey? Are you sure you're doing it right? <laughs> I think so. I was all clenched up like you're supposed to be with my arms and legs crossed tight, my eyes screwed shut, focusing real hard on my syllable. And after I sat like that for 50 minutes, I, I don't know, something got unhinged in my hip or something. I could barely get up. Your problem is the clenching. That's right. Uh, she's right, honey. You're, you're supposed to relax when you meditate. Mm, I don't know. That's not what the article said. Well, you should see somebody about it, and don't wait. Don't walk around on it. You know who you should see is my guy, Fernaz. He's the best acu Cairo in town. You should see an orthopedist. Oh, I'm sure it'll work itself out. Or it'll cause a domino effect through your entire body, and you'll end up riding a jazzy around Trader Joe's. Don't wait. <laughs> We're weak. That's what it is. We're like show ponies now. When I think of how my grandmother, God rest her soul, what she had to go through, and not just in a bruiser, which was very difficult country, but here in America, what women did in those days, the effort, the physical labor required to get the simplest things done, I mean, it killed them young, but at least they knew how to do for themselves. They had skills. I don't have skills. Nobody has skills. I have skills. I don't have any skills. That's why I'm calling your gardener, Carol. What gardener? What? Oh, no, Beth, not seriously. You hired a gardener? That doesn't sound like you. No, I didn't hire her. She hated her. I didn't hate her, for goodness sake. I just, she just wasn't a good fit for this neighborhood. Well, I'm desperate. You guys, I haven't mowed my lawn in 12 weeks. We know, we know. Well, <laughs> don't bother calling that person if you're looking to fix your lawn. She's against lawns. She, she wouldn't even talk to me about them. She's not even a real gardener. She's more of a forest ranger. What, like a Smokey the Bear type? Sort of. It, re it was really the most ridiculous conversation. She stood right here in this kitchen and told me she was going to rip up my lawn and plant a primitive forest there instead. A forest permaculture? 
Those may have been her words. Incredible. What? Incredible. What is it? I have been dreaming about getting back into permaculture. I even thought about bringing a guy in to consult on it. And here you are, Carol, doing permaculture right in my own backyard. But I'm not doing permaculture. It was all just a big misunderstanding. What is permaculture? Does everybody know about this but me? I don't. It, it's some kind of ancient forest ritual. No, no. They... A permaculture is a kind of a garden that mimics a natural ecosystem. Each plant in a permaculture has its own role and function, and everything you grow in it can be harvested for food, fuel, or medicine. God, Renee, you sound just like her. Yes, I know things. I told you I had skills. You know, I lived on a permaculture commune back in the day. Some of the best months of my life. It sounds intimidating, but it's actually easy peasy, a fun, low maintenance way to increase productivity. Really, every home gardener in America should be doing it. But you're not, you sound like, you wouldn't put that kind of thing in the magazine. You know what, Carol? That's a brilliant idea. Oh, no. If I pitched it this week, I could maybe even expense oh, her. Oh, Renee, no, no, no. The last thing I want to, when I open my nice copy of HGTV is a bunch of pictures of milk vetch and pawpaw. Pawpaw? What in the hell is a pawpaw? I have no idea. It is some kind of mango or no, a cactus. No, pawpaw or... Paw is an indigenous fruit tree that used to grow all over this country. No one really plants it anymore because the fruits look sort of like big swollen glass. Lands, but Ew. it is exactly. it's a wonderful native species and it's making a comeback. She does pawpaws. I'm calling this lady. Oh, no, <laughs> Renee, please. I have to say, I don't know if I'm so hot on having big glands swinging in my window. Right? No. Thank you. Pam, you of all people would love permaculture. It's all about producing the maximum amount of fruits and veggies so you can feed your family off the grid. Very DIY. I do want to feed my family off the grid. And it's true. The more DIY you are these days, the better off you are when the shit hits the fan. I don't know. You think I should call her? You know what? Call her. All of you. All of you. Call her. But full disclosure, not only did she threaten to destroy my lawn, she also... She, she also... hit on me. Are you sure? Excuse me, what? Oh, so she was, oh, uh... Oh, yes, she was. Oh, yeah. To be, to be honest, I couldn't even tell at first if she was a woman or a man. Well, how do you know she was hitting on you? Well, what do you mean, how do I know? I know. Did she talk dirty to you? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Did she flash you some kind of a signal? What? They sometimes use signals. No, she just... <laughs> I mean, granted, it's been a while, but I think I'm still capable of discerning when someone's hitting on me. Did she know you were married? I mentioned it several times. Well, I do not approve of that behavior, gay, not gay. Uh, maybe you just don't take this the wrong way, Carol, but maybe you just imagined it. I did not imagine. I'm not <laughs> questioning your experience, but it is kind of a cliche. The straight married woman assuming the lesbian service person is hitting on her. I remember when I was with Nadine, and we used to go to the bars around Providence, and she was always... Yes, we know, honey. In college, you were a big lesbian. You did many bad things, and everyone was afraid of you. We know. We know. <laughs> I was going to say that Nadine would often get misread as aggressive, when really she was just gender nonconforming, but I didn't realize that I was bringing up that subject so often. I'll try to be more mindful about it in the future. You, you really don't refer to it that often, Renee. No, you don't, honey. I'm sorry. I was just kidding. I kid. I'm sorry. I always like hearing stories about that time in your life. Me too. All right, everybody. It's fine. I'm fine. So what exactly did she say to you, the gardener? She, she said... She said, I had a pretty mouth. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, it's nice, but it could really go either way, right, Renee? No, she said it with a tone, a sexy tone. I'm sure she did, honey. Either way, it's nice to get a compliment, right? Mm -hmm. I guess. But I think I can feel safe calling her. She's not going to violate me out of sheer animal lesbianism. All right, stop it. 
I agree that you have a pretty mouth, honey, and I also am not going to violate you. <laughs> <it. laughs> come, come on, kidding, come, come on, we're kidding. Well, you know what? I don't even think I kept it. 802-655-2437. I read it on the side of her truck. Lights. Diane, outside. Oh, hello. Is someone calling me? <laughs> Is someone blowing up my cell? Diane strides into Renee's kitchen. I want herbaceous layers. I want species diversity. I want productivity at every level. Great. I've got the perfect setup for swales and rainwater harvesting out there. That steep grade? I don't know why I didn't see it before. And I'm guessing the soil is in decent condition, probably a little acidic, but nothing a little wood ash won't fix. You're speaking my language. Yes, I'm, I'm fairly experienced in this area. There was a time in my life when almost everything I consumed, I grew with my own two hands. I know you might not guess it to look at me now. I try not to make assumptions on, about people based on how they look. Me too. Well, I want the whole ride. I want cover crops, I want chicken. Oh, I don't do livestock. Oh, that's fine. I'm sure I can source my own chicken somewhere. The uh, woman I lived with after college, Nadine, <laughs> she was an urban homesteader, and she taught me that certain plants thrive in the company of certain others. It's called companion planting, right? Right. I want tons of that. Great. I want coppicing and, and willow fencing and a pollinator orchard and a self-seeding all-native species meadow. You're ambitious. Yes, I am. I should probably start by getting some dimensions and my tape measures in the truck. As a matter of fact, we were lovers. <laughs> Nadine and I. Good for you. <laughs> Shift. Pam at the island with a glass of chilled Chardonnay. Well, the world is not a fair place, I tell my son. I say you can do everything right, everything they tell you to do, and you still might not be lucky in this life. Sure. My daughter's headstrong. She doesn't listen. My son's softer. I tried hard for those kids, you know. I worked my ass off to get those kids. I ruined myself doing it. And I guess it's worth it. But also, who knows if anything's worth it, you know? Who does? Sometimes I look at them and, Jesus. <laughs> what about you? You think your life's been worth it? You made good choices when you look back on things? I feel okay about what I've done. I mean, that's really it, isn't it? No matter what happens, you want to be able to look back and say, I did my best. What came at me, I knocked it back over the fence best I could. I'd say I'm about 60-40 that way. I'm basically, basically comfortable. There's some things I do different. But this is the other thing. And I tell my son all the time, it's not too late. Till God takes your last breath, it's not too late to change your plans. Don't be afraid to be very bold in that direction. That's right. You don't like where you ended up, a particular path you're walking, you turn around, or you step off that path, or you make your own way through. For a while, I had a business out of my home doing inspirational quotes on soft goods and fine breakables. <laughs> It wasn't lucrative. My husband didn't love it, and eventually I had to give it up. But it gave me a lot of pleasure coming up with things to say. I have a knack for that kind of phrase, and it comes naturally to me. And I got a lot of emails from people all over the world who said the products really spoke to them, often in difficult times. Sure. With the internet now, it's incredible where you can reach people. I sent items to Japan. I sent to Guam once. Wow. It's like Guam today is what Pennsylvania was to us when we were kids, right? Anyway, my neighbor was telling me all about your pawpaw forest, and I'm definitely interested. I need to hear the details, but here's the thing. I have a little something else in mind. It's not practical, and it's not going to seem related, but I have always dreamed of having my own Italian garden, exactly like in the mural outside Delfini's. You know the deli on Front Street? No, oh, I'm not sure that I am familiar you with it. You haven't been to Delfini's? What's the matter with you? How long have you been in town? You haven't been to Delfini's? I am shocked. I am scandalized, Diane, truly. That is not neighborly of you. Not to patronize that place. It's a local family place. You gotta get your butt in there. I do, I will. First of all, it is delicious. Best delicatessen this side of Brooklyn in the prepared foods. So authentic, and plus the service. Anyway, and they have this painting. Now, I have not personally been to Italy. I'm full-blooded Italian, both sides. My mother's family, Abruzzo, my father's family, Napoli, but they met it in the States at a USO dance. It's a whole story. Now, my husband has been to Italy on business several times, but I personally have never been, and I was thinking that in case I never get to go, what I would love is to have my own little Italian garden just like the one outside Delfini's with the hanging vines and the roses and the fountain, the whole nine. And then even if I never get to go, I can still look out my window while I'm doing the dishes and see a little miniature version of it right there. Uh -huh. 
and I thought, now, if you're going to tear everything up anyway, I mean, I understand you might have to compromise a little, swap out, swap out a rose for a pawpaw here and there, but you can incorporate maybe a little of some of what's in that painting. Maybe. I... Thank you, Diane. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I can at Diane. least... Diane. Diane. I am not kidding you, you have to go to Delphini's. And you know what you get your first time there is the polenta. And on your way in, take a look at the painting. I'm not gonna lie, it's not a painting of a forest, it's a painting of a Mediterranean palazzo. But maybe a tiny little piece of it could be mine. Shift, Beth's kitchen. Beth takes a step towards Diane. It's just me, so I can have it any way I want. And I want a fairy garden. A, a, a what? I want a leafy bower, like it says in the poem. Ooh, what poem? I want you to put in the kinds of flowers that attract fairies, so I can lay my head among the mosses while they sing me to sleep. You can do that, right? Beth locks eyes with Diane. Diane pulls Beth in for a devouring kiss. Beth yields with absolute abandon. Diane sweeps Beth up and carries her out the French doors into the dark. <laughs> now Carol, Pam, and Renee appear in their respective kitchens. The single set represents all four. Dylan! Bill! Dan, did you start the white? Dylan! Your mother's on the phone about Thursday. Do not make me scream at you, honey. I need you to turn that down, please. Hey, Jeff, do we want to eat with your sister? There's things in there I need for tomorrow. Turn it down or I'm coming up there and break that machine into tiny little pieces. Honey, this is why Daddy got you the headphones. Bill! Dan! Honey, are you listening to me? <laughs> Did you, you hear, hear that? that? Oh, sorry, Mary. No, I, I just thought I heard something outside. How many times do I have to tell you if you don't bring in the trash cans, you get raccoons? Nothing, probably just a raccoon. Hang on, I'll get Bill for you. I frankly did not like the sound of that. Honey, are your windows closed up there? Dylan! Lights. Yay. Yeah. Okay, now we're gonna get up and go sit over there. Set change, transition. Set change. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'd like okay. to start by saying these are the finest water bottles I've ever experienced. Thank you, Guggenheim. Guggenheim, baby. Uh, okay, so I, I guess I was going to, I wanted to, this the, this, the topic of this play is kind of a moving target because, as you know, climate change is sort of moving and changing all the time. When I first was writing it, I was thinking about the storm that is going to happen in this play as being Hurricane Sandy. And then quickly I realized, like, there's storm after storm after storm now. And so now Hurricane Sandy is in the past of the characters in this play. And it was written for, you know, initially for this audience in New Jersey who had actually lived through the storm themselves. So I just was going to ask the, the actors what it was like to perform this play in that place. Do you guys have anything you want to say about that? I mean, there, uh, there was a very real sense of having gotten through something uh, devastating together that brought the community together, like in a way that I didn't expect. The, the sort of sense of um, warmth and bonded energy coming towards us when these characters talk about the storm and, and how they got through it and w how they tried to rebuild was uh, palpable. Um, so I, I had never quite had that experience of, of such a direct connection. I, and I had never considered, I mean, I was in Hurricane Sandy, but not in the same, not in like a tight community that was completely fully impacted in that way. And I, I hadn't considered what it would, do to neighbors and people to, to have helped each other and live through that together. <clears throat> I mean, I feel like 
in terms of being a writer and trying to think about how to write about topics that are that are moving and changing with, as the days change, it's I mean climate change also is a, a topic so fathomlessly huge it's hard to talk about. And so really the play is about it's about like what at what scale can we comprehend these phenomena? Like how small of a unit of people um, you know can we really understand? Uh, it's it's difficult to conceive of the entire ocean um, rising by feet. Uh, but but in fact, people and when catastrophe strikes, like we do reach out, you know, to our neighbors, the people that are closest to us. Um, I don't know. I personally, we I've been really thinking about like who actually lives next door to me when the lights, you know, go out. That makes a big difference. Like who's on your block, who's in your building. Totally. I also think the play is a really, to me, an amazing combination of the m microcosmic and the macrocosmic, you know, this, this idea of this God coming down and these giant forces around us and also the tiny universe of our, uh, our plots, our garden, the idea of like just this little step, the permaculture, you know, j j just how, uh, how intensely we hold on to our small patch um, and how hard it is to change even that. No, we were talking in the dressing room, I was saying about that woman after the show was really mad at the end. I won't tell you what happened. But <laughs> no, she you can like, tell what happens. You can say, what, what, why was this woman mad? She was mad because uh, Carol uh, won't relent, and so that it's only three instead of one, and then destruction comes and everyone dies. Uh, Carol <laughs> gets ripped apart. I like have to be like, I'm out. Uh, like, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't know, whatever the version of emasculated it is if you have a vagina. Uh, <laughs> I was devaginalated and just kind of gender neutrally went away. Um, <laughs> and she came up to me because we were doing, it was, yeah, she came up to me and she was like, that's not how it should end, this can't. And I was like, I'm just the actor, that's the writer. And then, um, <laughs> She beelined for you because we were collecting money for uh, something else happened about a presidency. And uh, uh, you were just like, hey, hey, that's just the way. I remember you guys having kind of it out. And she was, she, her husband was in one of those little like jazzies. And, and she kind of was motioning to him like, what about him? All this work I have to do, I've, you know, I can't have a hand like that. I've worked too hard. You know, with my like crippled husband, I can't, that can't be the end. Yeah, she was really upset. She was really mad, yeah. Well, I mean, We're tough, we're strong, she kept saying that. Well, I was gonna say that I feel like the thing that you feel so strongly about at the end of the play is how um, at the end we will only have each other and that fundamentally the love between the women and the cul-de-sac, the girls, is, is our hope for the future. And so even though the play is quite um, ultimately bleak after all of the raucous comedy. It's, it's only bleak in the last like minute and a half. Like, all, up before that, it's just like laugh a minute all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when it goes, it goes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I feel like that's, that's part of the great, I think, gift of the play is that um, despite the storm and the tragedy that I think the way that these women come together at the end and the hope that you actually leave us with um, that we will tend to and for each other is, is the great um, relief despite the tragedy.